Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, today we're going to have Professor Torsten Hofler um, present some of his work. Um, so Torsten has uh, been a professor at UIUC and now he's a professor at ETH Zurich. Uh, he's uh, visiting the quantum group here in, uh, in Microsoft, uh, and uh, he works primarily on uh, parallel computing performance, and uh, he's published over 200 papers, which is quite impressive. Um, Donald had pointed me to Torsten, and um, uh, I haven't been aware of his work, so you know it sounds very interesting, so I'm looking forward to learning about uh, his work today. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm from ETH, and I've been here uh, two months. And this is actually today my last day as a visiting researcher. Um, but it's likely I'll come back. So if you want to talk to me, then either catch me right after the talk or, <laughs> or later. Um, this is, in fact, work that has been done uh, with many people most uh, Almost centrally, my, my student Machi has contributed to the, the development of the uh, slim fly topology that I will be talking about. But at the beginning, I want to give a, a quick overview of uh, network topologies in general, what the development was. But, but let me start with a, with a quick statement about data centers. I mean, Microsoft is operating a pretty sizable data center business, and, and it seems to be moving further into the, the center, uh, central attention of the company, as, as we are all observing. And th there are some observations we can make about data centers. So first, um, Google, uh, some people from Google, so Dennis Upts, um, he actually observed in this, in this paper down here that about up to 50% of the energy consumption of a data center could be somewhere related to the networking infrastructure. So these are various components in the networking infrastructure and uh, other things. And furthermore, there's, a, there's another work that actually calculates that up to 33% of a network, 33% um, of a data center um, cost could be the networking components. So, this is something we have to see with a, with a grain of salt because, of course, that varies on the exact setting. So I, I believe there is a, a very large span. I would say here it's, it's somewhere between 20% and these 50%. It feels like very high. And, and then uh, the 33% that could also be lower, um, but it could also be higher. So that really depends on how well your data center is connected. But if you look at uh, the past of uh, these data center networks, what, what happened there? I mean, what happens from the early 1980s until uh, today, this is something we built on, so I want to quickly explain what was the, the kind of the, the history here. And in the early days, um, data center topologies, or at this time, like computer topology, so nobody talked about data centers in the early 1980s, that, that term wasn't probably even coined. Um, these early topologies were mainly restricted by the amount of silicon available on a single chip. So what that meant, they had to have a very small radix. So, so when I draw these, these graphs here, you just read them like a normal uh, graph, and, and every, uh, every vertex is a switch in the network, and every line is a connection, so a cable in the network. And what we can see here is that, that for this particular net network topology, we choose a dimensionality of the network, for in this case it's two, and then the radix, so the number of ports per switch we need to support is four. Right, so that's extremely simple. It's very, very simple to construct. And this is actually the main reason why these networks have survived for so long. In fact, if you pump this up a little bit, if you go to three or four or five dimensional tori, you can get a rather reasonable network. But of course, the radix is growing. But there are two problems with this network, and these are actually the, the two fundamental parameters we, carry about, uh, we care about in networking. One is the latency, and the other one is the bandwidth. So with latency, I mean, really mean the distance traveling from one vertex to another. And the maximum distance here is somehow the dth root of the total number of vertices in the network, so that's bad. <laughs> so that's actually very bad. And the bandwidth is even worse because you can cut this network very easily by removing um, uh, links from the network. So, so the global bandwidth I'm talking about here, that's uh, relatively bad in this network. Nevertheless, since they're very easy to construct, many HPC networks, so high-performance computing networks, have used that topology to scale very far because people call this network scalable, or this topology, because you can just add more rows and more columns in your, uh, in your particular topology. And if you want to build a very large computer, that's a very good thing. Um, by the way, there is a fundamental uh, disagreement between me and the rest of the world, or the rest of the networking architects, when we talk about scalability. I do not consider this network as scalable. So by scalability, when I say that term, I mean that the bandwidth scales and the latency scales as we add more vertices to a network. In this sense, this network is not scalable. However, 
everybody, every network architect, when the network architect says scalable, they usually mean, oh, we can add more stuff to it, and it's relatively easy to rewire the network. And, and in that uh, definition, it is scalable. So what happened then? Well, this was, of course, uh, discussed and, and discovered. So then we went to hypercube style networks, and there the benefit is that we could actually have a logarithmic latency, so that's uh, very good, and a full bandwidth. So now we have n divided by two, and we got rid of the square root term. Um, so we essentially have enough bandwidth that half of the nodes can to talk to the other half of the nodes without any congestion in the network, and not just the square root of those. Um, of course, the network radix is now logarithmic, so, so that is uh, fundamentally limiting your size of the network you could have at the end, because you will still need to build a switch with n ports, and then you can only have two to the n endpoints. And n was very small at that time. So what people developed, um, was, well, well, the first uh, idea to, to use were a brief, uh, well, kind of a brief idea, were tree networks. So people just looked at trees, and this is what many data centers look, uh, still look today. Uh, kind of the last generation data centers <laughs> look like tree networks. Sorry, can you yes. go even before I just define what bandwidth latency and means in this? OK, sure. So you mean here? Yeah, or in any of them. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the latency is, is really the, the maximum distance, uh, actually the, the distance of a shortest path from any vertex to any other vertex in the network. So here in this case, it's, it's a log base 2n. Right? So if you have n vertices, the maximum distance, which is the shortest path between the maximum separate uh, two vertices, is log base 2n. The shortest or the largest? That is the shortest path, not, not the between longest any, path. Between any? Between any vertices. Right. And then the bandwidth is really the... Um, how much bandwidth can I carry through the network in terms of n? Right, so if I'm, if I'm, for example, have a simple all to all pattern, everybody sends to everybody else, how much bandwidth can the network accept in that case? So you want this to be n. Right? So, and, and in the previous one, um, this was somewhat square root n to the d, so very low. We want this to be n, and this is uh, here in this case, this is perfect because we are very close to n. So okay. And the radix is basically your technology parameter where you, how large of a switch you need to build in order to support that network topology. So for example, in this case, is it easy to see why it's log, log n? For the uh, this is just a hypercube, so this is. Yeah, I guess I don't know what a switch is here. Well, a switch is a vertex. I, OK, so it's like the number of edges leaving a vertex. Mm -hmm. That's the radix, exactly. And, and as you grow the hypercube, uh, you will have more neighbors. I mean, you will, every dimension you add to the hypercube, you will double the number of neighbors. And this is why you have the logarithmic um, impact here. OK, cool. So and then we have this tree network. And, and everybody knows the tree, right? The bandwidth is 1, because we all need to go through the root. So that's bad. And the latency is, is 2 log n, because we need to go up and down. Right, so because a tree has logarithmic depth, and the radix is two because we have only two neighbors. Should have probably started with this one from an educational perspective because that's definitely the easiest one. Um, however, this is not how people build these trees because usually in, in a data center context, we have so-called top of the rack switches and then we have uh, backbone switches in the sense that the network uh, technology used for, the, for implementing these cables gets usually beefier towards the, the root and has just a higher bandwidth. Right. In HPC, or actually in modern technologies, we don't really do this um, because we want to have the fastest connection to the endpoint. So if we already take our fastest connection to the endpoint, we don't have any, any, uh, anything else to do to, to the top. So we just have that link speed that we want to get to the endpoint. Okay, so under that assumption, what uh, was developed, that was actually developed quite early on. This, uh, this is the so-called class network or, or fat tree network there. Not isomorphic, but very, very, very close. So we can discuss the differences, but they're usually minor. So this is a class network. This is a fat tree network. This is a folded class network. But they, they all have the same principle. The idea is that they have a fixed radix, and then they grow multiple layers with this fixed radix, which gives us a, a 2 log n latency. right? And, um, and that also gives us a full bandwidth in that particular case. So that's somewhat the dream topology. And in fact, this is the topology that is used for most of the uh, installations of large supercomputer systems today. It is used in many modern data centers today as well. So that's kind of the, the default topology. However, in this talk, I will tell you how to actually build a topology with very similar properties, but has half the cost. Right? Because we, we still want to fight constants. Asymptotically, this topology is optimal if you don't care about constants. But of course, in real life, if you actually invest a couple of hundred million into a data center, then you care about a constant of two. I hope uh, most people do. And then there is this uh, fancy Cowlitz topology that is, in fact, a graph. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about graphs. We are abstracting this away from, from the actual technology. 
um, whatever we implement these switches with. And that was used in the HPC context that is a directed graph. So all graphs before were undirected. And this is now a directed graph, so we could kind of need directed cables. I have not seen directed cables before, but that was constructed for this, and it's technologically feasible, was constructed for this particular uh, machine, the Psychrotex machine. Unfortunately, the, the startup company went uh, belly up pretty quickly after they, um, after they developed this. Uh, parts of the reason is that, uh, well, parts of the reason could be that this was an incredibly complex network to route and actually uh, to understand, um, but, but we will see. The nice thing here is that this is actually hitting a lower bound. So, so this is nearly strictly optimal. So if we go now from the 1980s to 2005, this is the, the quick summary I just gave you. But in that area, in, uh, around that time, two fundamental changes happened in the networking business. So one fundamental change is that we went from copper cables to fiber-enabled cables. At that time, suddenly fiber became affordable. It was around for a long time, but it became a mass market product. What does fiber change in the business? Fiber changes that we actually can go long distance. So suddenly we are not bound by, by locality constraints anymore. These copper cables, if, if you know, they're only five meters long if you run them at a high frequency. The fiber cables, they're a kilometer long, and basically you can, you can wire your data center twice in a row and still have a single cable, so that's perfectly fine. So that was change number one. We enabled long cables. Change number two is that we went from small radix switches to high radix switches, and that's just simply following Moore's law. We had more transistors available on the chips to build these switches, and then we could just build switches with larger radis, radices. Right? So we, we went from these four-port switches to today easily 100-port switches on a single chip. Right? That's, that's extremely important. Both these developments to, taken together led to the development of um, the Dragonfly topology, which um, there were two competing um, designs. I was part of one design, so one design actually survived. The other one didn't. Of course, I was betting on the wrong horse. So I was working with IBM and the so-called Perks topology. A wonderful idea. There was only one machine built, and I'm not allowed to talk about this. Um, OK, that's a very one large-scale machine built, and I'm not allowed to talk about this. However. A very similar topology was, was used uh, by Cray to build the cascade style, area style um, network that is um, where we currently have the largest installation in Switzerland um, with about 5,000 end nodes running that particular topology. And the idea here is that we have groups that are fully connected. So we see five groups here. And then these groups form so called super switches or super groups that themselves are again fully connected. So it's a two layer fully connected network. Typically, we use um, electrical connections within the group and optical connections outside of the group. That was the idea. That's a network that came from engineering constraints. And here we get, again, an approximately um, full bandwidth. So we're losing a factor of two here. I can talk about this. It's not too bad to lose this factor of two, in fact. And we get a fixed latency, so three to five. That also means that our maximum size of the network is limited. Right? So the maximum size of a cascade system that you can buy from Cray is about 65,000 nodes. Same for the Perks topology. You, you, we can't buy more <laughs> with those switches. However, that's enough for, for many um, installations. And there's also a fixed radix now that we are talking about. But now if we take this, um, we, we, take, we took all the experience we made with that topology. The pr all the previous topologies were kind of designed with a technology in mind. So, so we're ingenious engineers sitting there and trying to understand how to use the new technology constraints in order to um, build the next network topology. What we did as, as scientists, so I was always working with engineers because I really enjoy working with engineers, uh, but we have a slightly different viewpoint. So what we did is we said, okay, let's take this to the extreme. Let's just assume we have an all fiber network because fiber is relatively cheap today if you choose the right transceivers. And let's assume we, we want to build the cheapest possible network. And what I mean by cheap is we want to have a full bandwidth, so bandwidth of, of, a, of proportional to n. And we want to have uh, the lowest possible latency and the lowest possible radix at that time. So what happened then, and we use mathematical optimization property, uh, principles to achieve this. So, so this is really the, uh, the key here. But what we found is that actually if we drive this optimization, all we need to care about is the diameter. It took me quite a while to understand this, but, but after all, it's really, really intuitive. If you have a network where you run your traffic through and, and you have basically all-to-all -all communication, the further you go in this network, the more links you traverse, the more bandwidth you need on those links. If you go very short, you need less bandwidth, thus you need less cables. That's the intuition behind this whole idea. And now the question is, well, it's basically written here. And what we found is that we can, in order to get to the lower bound, 
we can uh, improve 50% over Fatry and, and one third over Dragonfly. So which means we can make these topologies at the same performance by a factor of two less expensive or by a factor of one third less expensive. Okay? So now let me tell you, when yes. Oh, the diameter is again the, the um, path length. So, so that's the, between any two nodes, the minimum path. You want to kind of shrink the graph as a whole. No, that's the same as the latency. Oh, it's yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I actually could have used latency. This is interchangeable. But the idea is that we want to make sure that any node can reach any other node in the network with no more, in this case, than two or four intermediate nodes or intermediate cables. OK, that's, that's the key idea. Um, let me look at an example. So we have an example that's a full bandwidth PET tree. This is, in fact, a machine that has been deployed in Japan. That's a Tsubama 2.0 machine that has a three-level fat tree. So this is just a normal fat tree. We have these switches, uh, three levels, level one, level two, and level three. OK, we have the, the cabling, as I showed before. It's, uh, I think, 24 or 36 port switches. I'm not so sure. Half of the cable's going down, half of the cable's going up. Very simple topology. This is a, this is a diameter four topology. We can uh, create a similar um, a similar setting with a diameter two topology that gives us 50% uh, less routers and 30% yeah, fewer cables in this particular case. The cables will be slightly longer, though. But, but fiber, the cost of fiber, as we will see in a couple of minutes, is actually not too much for, per meter. It's a lot per transceiver. So you pay a lot overhead per cable because you need two transceivers. Um, but per meter, it's relatively cheap. OK, so let me now explain how we built this. So this was just the, the motivation so far. But before we do this, I want to explain you this Moore bound. So the idea is now, well, if we now want to minimize the diameter for a given switch degree, right? So we, we have a technology, we have a, a, a switch that we have constructed. Let's say that switch has 15 ports. And now we want to build the graph that connects the maximum number of endpoints using, let's say, diameter 2 or diameter 3 that can be constructed with a 15-port switch. OK? So there is, in fact, an upper bound that's really easy to prove. So I'm going to prove you uh, this upper bound in, in the next five minutes. That's called the Moore bound. And the idea here is, in graph theoretical terms, that it's an upper bound on the number of vertices in a graph with a given diameter, so maximum minimum path between any two vertices, maximum minimum length path, um, and a given radix, so the maximum degree. But, but for, for our purpose, we choose the same degree for every single vertex. So it's a regular graph. So in this move on, it's very easy to construct. We basically say, well, if we have zero diameter, uh, well, then we can reach exactly one node. It's pretty clear. If the degree is k, well, how many more nodes can we reach in one step? Well, that's obviously um, 1 plus k. Okay? And if we have the degree, uh, the diameter, if we allow the diameter 2, we can reach as, at most, each of those can reach at most k plus 1 more. Right? And so on. And so now we can easily uh, show this Moore bound. And it's, it's really the sum where it ranges from uh, the k times the i equals 0 to d minus 1, and then k minus uh, 1 to the i. Right? So that's, that's by, by construction. That's the maximum number of nodes we can reach. In fact, that is not tight. This bound is, very, bound is very far from tight, but it is an upper bound. This is, in fact, the best known upper bound for this kind of graph. And um, looking at these large graphs is a very interesting uh, theoretical Construct. So you can, in fact, can you get your the graph named after you? So one of the famous graphs that hits the Moorbahn is the Peterson graph. The other graph I showed you, the Hoffman Singleton graph. There is only one other non-trivial graph. I believe it's 57 vertices or something, but it has to be checked that achieves that Moorbahn. That graph has not been found. So if you find it, you can get it named after you. There are whole. There's actually, if you Google for the degree diameter problem, this is a very well-known problem in uh, on, on Wikipedia. There's a page with people's names uh, and their graph constructions that hit the upper bound because people do. I mean, mathematicians uh, have fun with this. They try to really find the largest possible graph. We are not going to do this because if you look at this table, it is a, a double exponential problem um, to <laughs> to build these graphs exhaustively. And if we look at this, we see that we don't get very far. So we use another construction um, in order to build our graph. However, we can prove for that construction that it is within 10% of the Moore bound. So you can gain at most 10%. And, and if, if you have done any engineering, 10% is, is in the noise. So that's, that's fine. Um, so let me tell you a very high level picture of how that works, how we construct such a graph. And this now involves. First of all, I give you a high-level picture, and then I give you a little bit more detailed picture, because that involves group theory. So it's not uh, totally trivial, but it's also not complicated. Um, so we want to build 
a graph of diameter 2. Why do we choose diameter 2? Well, first of all, diameter 3 we have done with this graph I showed you before. The dragonfly graph, or the Perks topology, is a diameter 3 graph because we have groups, and we have at most one hop in the group, at most one intergroup hop, and at most one group, uh, hop in the target group. So we, this is a diameter 3 graph. We have such a construction. For diameter 2, it's more complicated because we don't have such a uh, close to optimal construction. Diameter 1 is kind of a useless graph because diameter 1 means, well, I have a single switch in the middle that needs to connect all nodes. Right? So that's not going to work because I will not build a switch for technology constraints, not build a single um, chip switch with 100,000 endpoints. Right? That's not going to happen. So how does our construction look like? Um, it's based on this uh, mathematical theory developed here, and we call them MMF, uh, MMS graphs based on the, the names McKay, Miller, and Siren. So we have two identical groups of routers that, that will be uh, the construction. So each of these uh, square, uh, dark squares, is, is a router in the network, or a switch, right? again, the same terminology. Then these switches or routers form groups. So here in this case, it's a five by five. So there are five groups of five nodes each in the left side. And these groups have identical connections. And I will explain you how these connections come to place in a couple of minutes. On the right side, we have exactly the same, but a different identical connection. So we have five groups. Each of those is identical, but they have different, uh, a different communication pattern. And then, this is still the very high level picture. And then each of those groups is connected to the other side, but it's connected to all the groups. As you can see, it feels a little bit like a dragonfly. Right? Like I've shown you before, the, the 2D, uh, the, the two level fully connected graph. So here, each of these groups on the left graph is connected to all of the groups on the right side, and vice versa, of course. So it's a very high connectivity pattern. Okay. So let me now um, explain a little bit more how to, in fact, build a real network like this. And it, it starts like uh, much of uh, group theory by selecting a prime number and finding a prime power. Right? If you, yeah, I see some, some people smiling and enjoying group theory. So we, like, we select the prime power. The nice thing is for computer scientists or engineers, 2 is a prime number. And any power of 2 will work to construct such a graph, if you like that. We will not use 2 as an example. but. Fine. And, and there's a theorem that we can show that any prime power Q can be decomposed into 4W plus delta. So you have to find this uh, decomposition. Let us also find just, just believe it, if, in, in case you're not familiar with that theorem. It's a, it's a very basic uh, theorem. And then we build a slim fly based on this, Q, uh, on this prime power Q that we found. And this Q is exactly here. So in, the, in this case, Q equals 5. 5 is a prime number, as we know. And we get, uh, obviously, 5 by 5 twice, so two, two, uh, two Q square uh, many routers in that network. Okay, so that's the graph construction. And the network radix you can, you can compute by using this delta uh, from up here. But that, that again, we, we will see in a couple of minutes. Once we have picked that prime power, we have to um, build a, a so-called finite field. And again, if you like group theory, you will immediately relate to this. And the idea of this finite field, if, if Q is prime, that's the easiest case. So for example, in 5, we can do this. The finite field will just have all the elements from 0 to Q minus 1. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in this case. Okay? With modular arith arithmetic uh, modulo 5 in all these cases. Okay, for example, if you look at this Q equals 5, we get 2 times 5 square routers. So that's 50. Network radix will be 7. And so here it's 5 by 5. And the finite field will go from 0 to 4. Uh, very, very simple. OK, cool. So now let's actually um, look at how we can label these routers. We will need this later. So now we have these 50 routers here. And now we can uh, arrange them in a very simple uh, labeling space. We can first have, um, for the Q equals 5 example, we can name the left graph 0 and the right graph 1. Okay, And then we can, of course, uh, introduce this finite field sub Q times finite field sub Q. Right? So we name uh, those guys 5 by 5. And it's a very simple three-dimensional naming scheme. OK, so that's, uh, is there a question? Oh, no, good. So that's an extremely simple scheme that we will get back later to. But now, once we have found our, fin our prime power, we have uh, constructed our finite field. Now there is, uh, for, finite, for each finite field, we can find a primitive, a so-called primitive element in a finite field. So a primitive element is an element in a finite field that generates a finite field. So that's, again, a, a tiny bit of group theory. Um, so what it really does is that all non-zero elements of the finite field are, cons can be constructed by taking that primitive element to some power, modulo the size of the finite field. So we can basically write everything as this psi to the i, right? Or eta to the i, sorry. 
Um, so in this case for E F5, uh, what we can do is we find this primitive element equals two. Now the typical question is how do you find the primitive element of a finite field? Uh, yes, we don't know. However, there is one. We know that there, that there is one. And uh, for all the constructions that we have, we have done so far, it's really easy to find via brute force. You just try. <laughs> uh, we have a small Python script that finds this. Um, there, there are some shortcuts to finding uh, primitive elements. But it doesn't even, it's even, not even worth doing it. So we just uh, brute force the thing. Um, and that's very simple. Actually, as you can see, uh, because the finite fields, they, they don't have to get very large until we reach 200,000 or a million endpoints in the network. Um, so, so we don't need that large, uh, these large finite fields. You can easily check that 2 is a, is a primitive element. I don't want to do it with you because you have to check every single uh, of those uh, four values here. But for example, if you look at, um, well, I mean, the, this 2 to the 4 mod 5 uh, is basically the same. And it's, it's 1, right? So 2 to the 4, 16, mod 5 is 1. Good. Um, what we do then, and, and this is also very well known in, in the field uh, group theory, we, we build the set of even powers and the set of odd powers. This is the set of even powers. This is the set of odd powers. And again, this is a very mechanical thing. You don't need to understand anything. You just apply it. And here, we have these two sets, x and x primes. So again, the even powers, uh, this to the 0, to the 2, and so on and then um, the odd powers. Again, once we have these two fields, here in this case it's 1 and 4 and 2 and 3, um, it's still very simple, we can use these fields to build the connections for these groups. Okay, so, and this is also a relatively simple rule, so we first look at the set of the um, odd powers, which build our connections for subgraph 0, and the set of the even powers build our connections for subgraph 1, Again, if we go through the example, we look at the routers, we look at one of this column, and we look at our set, 1 and 4, and now we check, we connect all routers that have a vertical Manhattan distance of the element in the set. So first we look at 1, well, we connect every router that has a distance 1, right, so it's relatively simple. And then we look at 4, well, there's only, there are only two routers that have a distance 4 here, which are the top and the bottom one, and then we are done. And we do this for all the groups on the left side, we apply 2, 3 for all the groups on the right side, and we are done. This is our intra-group connection. Okay? And obviously, this is not a real network. We need to connect the, the groups among each other as well. So the intra-group connection, and there we have a, a simple linear rule that two routers, 0xy and 1mc, are connected if and only if y equals mx plus c. So again, a very simple rule to evaluate. You can write a very small script that just builds these graphs, so we have lots of these scripts. And uh, if you look at an example, we take this router 100, zero, zero. so here x is 0, y is 0, and m and c, well, m and c, uh, sorry, here m and c is 0, but you can exchange those. And that would connect this router to all these routers back here. Okay? If you just pick another example, the 110 router, so that guy would connect to the diagonal of the routers. It gets a pretty, it becomes an interesting structure, but that's due to these um, prime fields, these finite fields. <coughs> would make it actually uh, quite pretty, in fact, if you look at those graphs <laughs> at the end. And then uh, I don't want to do all the examples because it gets uh, not so pretty if you plot them on a 2D, uh, a very small 2D space. So it's a very tightly connected network at the end. And, and this construction guarantees, and as I'll get to in a minute, that we only have one intermediate hop from getting from A to B. Right? So we will, and this construction also guarantees, which is not so easy to show, that we are within 10% of the moor bound. So that can be proven, but that's nothing uh, for this talk. So we need to talk. How much is the radix? The radix is this uh, 3q uh, minus 4 or something. So, so that's also related to the prime power you choose. Mm -hmm. So now the question is, now we have built the network of switches. Right? So now we have connected all the switches. But of course, switches are kind of useless without servers. So how do we now put these servers into place? And that's a very simple question. How many endpoints do we attach to each router? OK, so here we have a switch. We have the, the cables going into the network. And here we have the number of endpoints. So this is everything up here is kind of the slim fly topology. Everything down here is just our use of that topology. Okay? And the rule is, is relatively simple if we want full global bandwidth. So what, was full global, what does full global bandwidth mean? It's basically if we run an all-to-all -all steady state, which means each of those nodes or, or endpoints down here injects packets as fast as, as it can into the network and addresses those packets to random endpoints in the network. Okay, that's, that's the workload we want to support, just random global all-to-all -all communication. Okay? And we want to achieve...
that each of those endpoints can do this at the full line rate, as much as this link supports. By the way, this link is as fast as any link in, link in the network. So there's a homogeneous uh, link speed network in this case. Okay? So the, all of these guys shoot as fast as they can to all other nodes. And the rule is uh, relatively simple. So here's again an animation. And the rule is relatively simple. So we can compute this. I'm slightly running out of time, so, so let me uh, just give you the result. The idea is, and, and you, you can derive this, um, the intuition is again that we have, um, do I have an animation for this? Exactly. So that we put one third of the, of the links from the router that leave the router to endpoints and two thirds to the network. Why is it two thirds to the network? Well, remember, we have a distance two network, right? So this means these one third, they will shoot into the network and they will leave, they will occupy one third of the outgoing links, right? Just by shooting into the network, okay? But then there are also these other nodes <coughs> that need to route through my router because they have to have an intermediate hop and get out again. This is, again, one-third incoming and one-third outgoing. So that's the intuition. If you have a diameter three network, by the way, this would be one quarter at the end, and so on, right? If you assume uniform routing, and we will get to the routing. We do actually uniform load-balanced routing in this network. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, I see people nodding. Perfect. So now let's do two very simple cost models, and the, the, there are two ways to arrange switches and routers, uh, sorry, uh, switches and endpoints in a network. So one is this top of the rack model that everybody uh, seems to be using. So we have our racks here. Uh, there is about a one meter distance that gets actually relevant for the cable length uh, computation. So we have a one meter distance between those. And we can have a different uh, network or a different layout where we put all the switches in the middle of the data center. Right, so the inter-switch links will be very short, but there will be long wires coming from the, from the endpoints to the switches. In fact, this is a slightly better configuration in, in most of the, of the cases. This is slightly easier to install and maintain, because here the problem is if you have your large switch in the middle, you need to route all cables somehow through real space into that uh, middle thing, and that usually becomes a total mess. Well, if, if you do this, you have a nice distribution of your cables throughout the whole data center. Right? You don't have the one uh, point of failure also, so usually people like this in practice, this looks better in theory. Um, OK, and now, of course, we have to talk about uh, cables at the end if we want to really define costs at the end. So we have a very simple uh, cable cost model. And here the idea is that we have a length in meters and the cost dollar per gigabyte per second. Right? And then we, we look at uh, various cables, so Mellanox cables typically, so fiber cables you can buy uh, on the market. In fact, this number comes from Colfax Direct, so we just look at an online shop what these cables cost. So they're not representative if you, if you buy it at volume. Right, but we're assuming that they get equally cheaper. So we're assuming that fiber cables get equally cheaper to um, copper cables if you buy at volume. What we can observe is that these are the copper cables. We can also already observe they only go to seven meters. You cannot buy a copper cable longer than seven meters. Okay? We still assume you could buy a linear fit. Um, the fiber cables start very high, so they're extremely expensive for short cables because the transceivers are so expensive. But the cost per meter, okay, remember, length here, is very low. So you can go very far once you have invested your transceivers for the fiber cable. Um, here, the transceiver is basically free, so only the cable costs. Um, this is the difference, but this is what we use for the later cost model. Here, we have the exact numbers here for of the two fits. The router cost model is similar because we need to worry about the different radix and the cost dollar of the router. Here, we have some numbers, and we see that there's also somewhat a linear relationship between the radix of the switch and the cost of the switch. That is, was very surprising to me. Uh, I was expecting a more like a quadratic relationship because a crossbar, full bisection crossbar takes quadratic chip space. But somehow that turned out linear in practice. Um, and we used, uh, again, Mellanox gear uh, just because we could get this uh, commodity off the shelf pricing. If you now look at these different topologies, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the idea here is we have uh, the number of endpoints at this axis, so in thousands, so up to 50,000 uh, nodes in the network. Yes? Consider like the cabling cost and the maintenance cost. So, like you know, if a cable goes bad, or you or you made a mistake in cabling, then you know rerouting it. You know, how, how does that? The, <laughs> so, so there are two answers to this. So, first of all, we, we don't directly consider it because it's extremely hard to assess what that means. So, so my favorite story here is that, that I was actually I was helping to construct the Blue Waters system at, at NCSA, which was the largest academic supercomputer, so five hundred million dollar project at the time. Went online twenty twelve. Was a three D torus. You would assume that's a very simple topology to cable, 
Um, and, and I was uh, helping to design the network at that time, or, or helping to uh, also do performance analysis. And then I thought, OK, let's, let's actually walk into the room and cable one of those racks. Right? So, so I went there. I, I have no physical abilities of my own, right? but I still tried to cable one of those racks. And it looked like a total mess, even for a 3D torus. What is the reason for this? Because the 3D torus, you have to arrange it in kind of a 2D space, but you also have to make sure that these wraparound links don't get very long. So what you do is you fold it. And at the end, once you've done all this folding and this arranging in the 2D space, the cabling doesn't look very regular anymore, at least not to my uh, limited ability of uh, assessing it. So in fact, I would conjecture that even a more complicated topology would not look much more complicated if you wire it. Because at the end, what you do when you wire these, or what I did uh, in the particular Cray setup, is you have your, your, your table, your sheet of paper, there's numbers on it, and then you take the numbered cable into the numbered port here, and then have to make sure that it goes into the other numbered port down there. Um, I would assume we could do the same. It's just that the numbering would be a different permutation of those numbers. So I would not be too worried about that, even though I have very limited uh, experience with this, I have to say. The second question is, I'm actually not a big fan of re rewiring. So you mentioned what, what happens if these cables fail. Let them fail. So we will get to this. I'm a big fan of fail-in-place networking, because you cannot pull a cable anyway. Like if you have, if you, you have cable lying in a, like fiber cable lying in, into a, in, in a cable enclosure, and our cable enclosures, even for the blue water system, were like this thick. Um, for the uh, for the perk system that we were planning, they would have been like this. Okay, so <laughs> that was that was a completely crazy system, and then there were I don't know 100 kilometers of cable or so was was the the deal for that system. Um, but you don't worry about it. You put them in, and the idea for the, for these systems was actually just throw a new cable over the old ones. But most topologies actually degrade gracefully. Uh, Toros does not but Dragonfly does and Slimfly does, as we'll see in a minute. So which means if a cable fails, ah, the routing will fix it, no worries. As long as not more than 10% of your cables fail, you will not lose more than 10% of your bandwidth. And in fact, it even degrades gracefully afterwards. So if you lose 20% of your cables, you lose 20% of your bandwidth. The question is now, well, when do these things disconnect? <laughs> so when do you actually have a, a, a node that you cannot physically reach anymore because too many cables failed? There will be a slide on this in two minutes. Let me just finish the cost argument. Um, and the cost is just purely the cost of equipment, the cost of the cables, as I showed you the cost model, and the switches. Right? So nothing else, no, no installation, uh, nothing. And here we see that it gets, I mean, these, these uh, just to, to pick out one, the fat tree is here. Um, Slimfly is, of course, the cheapest one. Dragonfly is slightly more expensive. So there is this factor of two here, typically, and the factor of one third here. Um, and then you could look at Taurus. Taurus is even more expensive. So this is, but this is something to look at uh, with more time. Just believe me, it's the cheapest uh, network. And, and the more bound would be slightly below here, like 10% or so. Um, OK. The cost of the cables was proportional to the length. Yes. How, how you calculate the length between the nodes? Oh, the, this, is, uh, this is why I showed you the data center layout uh, picture. So this guy here, here. One meter here, we assume that there's one meter interact distance. If you actually look at this paper, you get a much more detailed description of, of like the enclosure size and everything, we assume. So we really model a full data center uh, setting. And that makes it rather complex, in fact, to, to get all the, the routings. And, and even the layout is non-trivial. But, but that's all described in the paper. So let's let, just look at a case study. Let's assume we want to build a network with 10,000 endpoints, which in the SlimFly would get us uh, a radix, necessary radix of 43, and would get us 700, only 720 switches with 10,000 endpoints. I, I find this pretty cool, actually. A very small number of switches. Um, and if you look at this, if we keep the radix constant, um, we could build these different networks like fat tree, random topologies, flattened butterfly, dragonfly, and we would see that they would all be much more uh, expensive in terms of power per node and cost per node than slimfly. And if you just look through this, this is always smaller here. And if you say this is unfair because we fixed the radix and we get slightly num different numbers of endpoints, we can also fix the number of endpoints here and have a variable radix. By the way, all these other topologies, we drive into the optimum for their setting. So we say we want to build the optimal flattened butterfly network, and we just pick the right radix for this. Right? Um, and if we do this, then, then we, again, we get uh, about 20% cheaper in, in terms of energy, and, uh, well, 30% cheaper with the best competitor in terms of, um, of cost. OK? Very good. Now this resilience uh, question that, that we had on, oh, like you didn't really ask that question, but it's kind of related. Can we just have this network uh, degrade uh, randomly? And the idea here is we, we look at a fully connected network and we check what happens if we remove links, like random, random links. 
lot of Monte Carlo simulation studies. We do this for all these networks, and I don't have enough time to go through this because I'm already slightly over time. But the, um, the percentages you see here, this is really how many, per, how much, uh, how, many, how much percent of the number of links you have to remove before the network becomes disconnected, meaning one node is not reachable anymore in the network. And you can see with the fat tree, that's about 35% for small. Torus is really bad. Actually, it goes down if you have more, more nodes because it's really too easy to disconnect one guy in the corner. Um, while for random topologies and slim fly, random is expected to be very good because cables are just light randomly anyway. Um, and Slimfly, it's about as good as random, better than Dragonfly, and better than Flattened Butterfly. Very unexpected as well, so it's one of those results where you look at, oh, but actually it makes sense graph theoretically, and we can talk about this offline. Do you, do you leave also when the whole node goes down, and then the goes down? Uh, no, we didn't do this. Uh, but it behaves similarly, I would strongly suspect. So, so we didn't look at, at node failures, only at cable failures, or link failures. OK, so, so then we could talk about routing, but let me skip this in the interest of time, because it's, again, um, you can use the Galois field theory that I explained earlier to route. And now let me get to the, uh, the last result I want to show you. This is actually real simulations for that uh, network. I just, did I just say real simulations? Well, <laughs> OK, so, so we didn't actually build a physical network because, because we don't have that much money. But we used a simulator that was developed by, uh, by Professor Deli and his students at Stanford to show the utility of the Dragonfly topology, we took the same simulator and ported it to Slimfly. And here are some simulation results with that exact uh, same simulator. So it's not our simulator, that's what I want to say. And it's a, it's a real setting. And how does this work? So this is, again, slightly, um, if you're not used to looking at these networking plots, let me explain this. So we have a latency. This is basically, we have an all-to-all -all pattern, right? As I mentioned earlier, every node injects packets into the network that have a random destination node. And they are routed through the network according to the routing strategy that I will talk about in a minute. OK, well, they will get, somehow get to the destination. Here we say, well, what if we send zero packets per second? OK, that's not uh, close to zero. Of course, we, if we send zero, then we get nothing but uh, close to zero. And here is what if we send as fast as the link supports, right? So zero offered load until one offered load. Ideally, and, and then the latency here, right? So what happens if you push data into a network? All of those plots are very characteristic. They start at the latency. This is the lowest, this is basically your, your diameter of the network. You can see SlimFly is always best in terms of latency um, because the diameter is lowest. Right? So these, the, um, this thing here is SlimFly with minimum routing. Um, this is SlimFly with another routing. Um, this is fat tree up here. And then it's Dragonfly here. And you see SlimFly diameter 2, Dragonfly diameter 3. Fat tree diameter four, so you can see this here uh, very clearly. Right? If you have no load, well, the, the network is empty. And now assume if we increase the load, and it's like in real traffic on a real street, if we increase the injection of cars into a network. Remember, it's a lossless network, so like cars, packets don't get lost. Right? Um, and at some point, there will be a traffic jam in the network. Right? At some point, the network will be, just be clocked up. This is when this goes to infinity. So this means your network stops, essentially. All of these go to infinity. None of those goes to 100%, because routing is not ideal. Um, what we can see here, the question is now, well, how, how does it behave for this going to infinity? So Dragonfly doesn't fare all that well. Um, that's because routing is very complicated under Dragonfly. Here we see Fat Tree is the best one. Actually, Fat Tree has the latest going to infinity, which means it has the highest bandwidth, but also twice the cost. But if you see this distance here, it's only like 5% more. So it's, again, one of those things. Well, do I want to pay twice as much for 5% more uh, bandwidth? Maybe not. And then we have the SlimFly, which is here very close, the next con contender for uh, the Fat Tree. OK? So these are uh, the networks. And then I could show you uh, a large number of other plots that you can find in the paper. <laughs> but I guess uh, that's probably not uh, appropriate here. And I want to wrap up briefly. Um, with a couple of takeaway messages. So first takeaway message is that we now have a lowest diameter topology in the sense that we now approve the Moore bound. It's going to be very hard at all impossible to improve upon the cost of this topology because, well, it's a theoretical bound that we cannot make much better, and it is resilient. We have, uh, it's very cost and power effective, 25% um, over Dragonfly and 26% and in terms of uh, power. and um, it gives you the lowest latency because diameter two, right? And it gives you a full global bandwidth. And then we have lots of uh, results for this. And one last uh, thing I wanted to mention, you can actually use that same topology to build a network on chip. 
which is exactly the same, <laughs> very nice properties, but of course in a different setting because network on chips have different parameters. They don't have fiber connections, for example. Um, but we did this, this appeared this year at ASPLOS, but it's basically the same construction, a slightly different layout because we need to lay it out in a 2D uh, book graph style topology, so a limited number of layers. But this works really, really well in a network on chip as well. And we assume that there are many different other uses for this. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I am open for questions. Any questions that haven't been asked during the talk? Yes. So do you have any intuition why you are making that graph using those finite fields? And um, <laughs> so yes, uh, but it took us a while to develop that intuition why we do this. Eventually, it, it, is, it is really a graph theoretical problem that, that you want to solve. And, and the nice piece is that this problem, this degree diameter problem, and you should really Google for it, is very interesting for uh, theoretical mathematicians. So there has been quite some work on this. And the, the idea why uh, we go through these finite fields is, or why they go through these finite fields is really to, to uh, build the graph with a maximum girth. So, so the girth is, is the, the length of the um, shortest path of, of, the, of the circle, right? The, the shortest length of the circle. You want to maximize this because you want to distribute your data as much as possible, as quickly as possible to as many nodes. If you have many short circles, I mean, uh, ignore trivial circles, right? Then this is not uh, suitable too well. So that's kind of my intuition that I developed over time. And you could also look at Ramanujan graphs and, and there are other graph classes uh, that, that are that don't only work for diameter two, but they're further away from the Moore bound. So for diameter two, we are very lucky that we have this one construction that gets us very, very close. Um, for the others, larger one, lar larger diameters, we don't. But for larger diameter, we have different topologies that we could use. So, so I mean, that, that space is covered well. Any other questions? Uh, does the routing need to be optimized to know yes. the topology? Yes, yes, I skipped the routing slide. <laughs> but, but you can actually use the same, the, by construction, you know where the cables are. And by construction, you can find the shortest path from any, in this three-dimensional space that I lined out, um, you can find which node to hop to and where to go to the final destination. But that's not all. Routing is slightly more complicated. You cannot really employ shortest path routing on this topology. I had to skip this for... Uh, for time reasons. Well, you can. Okay, so uh, let me be more precise. Um, you can apply shortest path routing where you just route along the shortest path, which is always of diameter two, right? But if you do this, then I can give you a traffic pattern where you will look really bad. So I will, I will just give you, I will just choose some nodes and I will create a congestion that is uh, of the order of k, right? So if k is your, your uh, degree. Um, and this is really easy to construct, actually, so it's, it's not too hard. So if you don't want to run into this problem, what you have to do if, is you have to uh, employ adaptive routing. So you have to somehow check, well, how busy is my next link? And if that link is very busy, because already too many, too many endpoints are sending onto that link, I'm sending it in, along a non-minimal path, right? So and this is in, in, in the results. Um, I, I skipped this for time reasons, but I can talk about it. So here we have different routings. Uh, this is minimum routing. Right? This is what I just said. There's no adaptivity. I'm not looking at the, um, where, uh, at the state of the network, so it's completely oblivious. Um, then we have a Valiant routing, which is also oblivious. But what Valiant routing does is it picks a random other node. We are routing to this random other node, and then this random other node runs to the destination. It doesn't do too well <laughs> because we're losing half the bandwidth. You can also see that it's asymptotically approaching, approaching 50% because we now double the path length. Okay, but that's one of these things. And then we can use this UGAL routing, which was also developed at Stanford, um, which gives us there are two different variants here. No, actually this L, which gives us a very good um, result as well. And UGAL is now uniform, I think uniform global adaptive, and this L is, is for local. Um, uniformly global adaptive load balanced uh, dash local. There is a global one as well. Local only assumes local knowledge of the switch. Global is kind of unreasonable uh, because it assumes that you know all the other switches state in the network when making a routing decision, which of course you don't. But they use this in the thesis of the, of the student just to get the upper bound. I mean, what if we would know? This is why we didn't consider it. So this is the adaptive routing that we would uh, suggest using for SlimFly. Um, in fact, a very similar routing is necessary for Dragonfly. So 
And, and Dragonfly, just this is why we only have one result here. Dragonfly, by default, uses that routing. Any, or my, my uh, conjecture would be that any low diameter topology that is cost effective will need um, adaptive routing. Right? Fat tree kind of also needs it, but you can get around it. Um, for example, most InfiniBand networks, Fat tree are routed statically. On the adaptive ones, do you know? Well, this is this is the closest, but then this one is also close. Or yes, you go to from shortest to longest. Guess, Correct. Right? Correct. What you typically have is you you have a table. Um, you, you look at your output queue length. So you, so you look at what's what's the traffic jam into that direction. If it's too much, then I, I have a I have secondary and, and tertiary tertiary options where I just move to the next one. Check if that's too long, and if that's too long, then I go to the next one and so on, and thereby distance. Oh yeah, there, there are about five papers how to optimize this for SlimFly um, by by a Spanish a Spanish group that has specialized on routing. So so we have just used the standard routing, but they're actually building a real technology out of this is is also not so trivial because again you need to have all these tricks how to actually get your packets to the network. Then there's also a virtual channel question: how many virtual channels do you need? Um, that you don't have deadlock. So, so this much more complicated than I could explain in, these, in this 40-minute talk. Um, but actually, quite many other groups have invested really heavily into, into making SlimFly work. So we now understand fully how to build it. So that's, and, and there, is at least, uh, there are at least two companies that are very seriously looking into building it. The problem is I signed that I'm not allowed to talk about those companies. <laughs> so, so but, but there is very high interest because we now really understand it. And um, if you have a router for Dragonfly, which we do, right? There is a company that builds a router for Dragonfly. Um, the same router will work for, with some minor modifications for SlimFly. So because Dragonfly already needs adaptive routing. So SlimFly is not more complicated. It needs different directions, but that's all. Technology is the same. So how do you use these insights for building a quantum computer? <laughs> <laughs> well, now the, the, the question is, uh, how much compute do you actually need in order to, uh, to build a quantum computer? If you can have that compute on a on a single um, on a single chip, then you probably don't need it. Well, even even though the the on chip version of that thing you could need because you would still route uh, among multiple elements. But what now if that compute, for example, for quantum error correction, which can be arbitrarily expensive, <laughs> as we know, depending on what exact scheme we use and and how long uh, the coherence time should be, um, we may need much more compute than this. And then you would build a larger scale system out of those guys. And actually, it doesn't only get um, good for larger scale. It also begins to, to kick in with like 40, 50 endpoints. So for example, the, the network on chip topology that we uh, designed that starts with a design for 100 um, tiles on the chip. And we get best performance for 1,000. But, but yeah. Also, the topology of the qubits itself, right? How the qubits are made on the and that, that's what I always wanted to discuss, exactly. Can you use this for, uh, for teleportation networks or for swap networks? But there it seems that, that, these, that these swap networks, they, they, need, to to each other they need physical. They need to be physically connected. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly, exactly. Once I mean, four qubits is not, but once we start scaling the number of qubits, these same principles will probably. Correct. Once we fully understand what the properties of the qubits are, <laughs> yeah, okay, I should, yeah. um, then, then the, we, we, sh we could look into this if this makes sense. And I believe this would actually make sense because this, this graph class is extremely powerful. Right? Not, not using the technology, but, but just using the graph class and applying it to the same problem. Yeah, I, I believe that would be a, a very good thing to look into once, once we understand the <laughs> properties. Cool then. Thank you.